Let me very respectfully stand on every and all due existing protocols. Mine is going to be more of an interactive section because I want to learn. I want to listen to you. I want to listen to your questions, be able to answer them, and be able to take notes. As you've listened to Professor Tommy, who I've told you about what we're doing, we're not trying to run the usual politics where somebody is campaigning to be president or to be governor, to be anything. We're trying to bring a change in a collapsed system. And when we bring a change, bring a true change, a change that is committed where all of you and everybody is involved. We want to take back our country. Yeah. We believe that today our country is not governed or served by people who believe in the country. I've been going about, you are the sixth stop. I have touring various cities from Germany to Toronto to everywhere. You are the sixth one. Everywhere I go and see huge number of Nigerians. The question is, who is remaining in Nigeria? Those who are remaining are probably those who couldn't get out. <laughs> and as I go about, I ask myself a question. And I look around and ask myself, what, is, what makes this place better than Nigeria? We have better... We have free market, actually. We have very strong free market policies. We have better weather. We have better environment. We have better food. Everything, we're family. We're, we're better people, I can tell you. We... You can be hungry in Nigeria and your neighbor can give you food. Why? If you're hungry in America, nobody's going to give you food. <laughs> so we have everything. So what is wrong? Why, how did we, how did we get to a stage where today nobody wants to go back there? How did we get to a stage where we have millions of people in a country that is so blessed with everything, hungry. How do we get to where the place has been become one of the worst places when you talk about terrorism, kidnapping, all forms of criminality? How did we get where, if you refer people who are unemployed in the world, we're there? What happened? This is a country in the 80s. Most of you went to school in Nigeria and are proud to say you are Nigeria. In the 80s, you cannot compare Nigeria with China, with Korea, with all these countries. We have three times the reserve of China. Today they have three trillion. These are countries that we cannot compare us with. People used to come from Saudi and everything to patronize our teaching hospitals and everything. So how did we get here? Indians were all over the place. In Nigeria, teachers, 
Philippines and everything. Today, we are going to India. We want to just escape to anywhere. No matter where it is. How did we get here? All you are seeing in Nigeria today is cumulative effect of leadership failure over the years. The only thing that Nigeria lacked is leadership. And that is the leadership that brought us where we now have the highest number of people living in poverty in the surface of the earth. Where we now have the highest unemployment. Where we are now live in fear of insecurity. And we don't know where. And some of you who are lucky to be here, as I said, are faced with double tragedy. I will explain it to you. So what are we trying to do? Is what part I've explained to you. Ours is that we can take this place back. We can fix it. This looks difficult. Countries have gone through this. It's mentioned to you about what happened in India. It happened in Brazil or South America. We were in a total mess a few years ago. All they needed was have people who are prepared to sacrifice and say, we can change here. We can fix it. And it can happen. We have the people. We're assembling it as a team. We don't want somebody to go in and say, oh, I'm Mr. Obi, I'm, I'm president. It's time for everybody to remove all those when the MC was announcing, he was trying to call everybody honorable. MC, we're trying to remove all those titles. want to remove the fire. We don't want to call people excellence again in Nigeria. Because there's nothing excellent there again. <laughs> we don't want people to be distinguished. When I came in here, like I said to every other place I've been, I saw people, but I noticed that it maybe it was uh, it wasn't you people. Because um, I'm not happy. And I thank people of Syria that we're doing this in a church. That's actually where we should be now. <laughs> so wherever I go, they've been trying to celebrate or sing, and I said, no more celebration in Nigeria. It is time for us to get to work and fix the country. <laughs> the potentialities are there. It's going to be difficult. Extremely difficult. Let nobody kill you. The next government is not going to be easy. It is going to be difficult. Very, very difficult because your country is bankrupt. It doesn't have resources again. If you listen to next year's budget, it will frighten you. Somebody asked me this morning that everybody's been asking, Peter, how do you think? This will work. How do you have a situation where, just to give you an example, the first four months of this year, January to April 30th, our revenue is 1 trillion 63 billion naira. But our expenditure within the same period was four trillion seven hundred and twenty billion. So we so if you minus the deficit is three point one trillion. So how does a business that spends three times its revenue survive? How are you going to do it? That's what everybody is asking. Peter, do you think this can survive? My answer is 
Very difficult, but the business can survive. It can survive with borrowing money. Our next year budget is going to be about 18 trillion, and we're going to borrow 11. Again, the question is, how is this business going to survive? And I told somebody earlier this morning, you know, I said to him, the business will survive. Amen. Businesses have come back from bankruptcy, even in America. What he needs is that he needs competent managers who have the capacity and vision to run it. And I can understand that it will no longer run the way it's been running. Managers that can understand that this is time to shut down the cost. Managers that understand that you can no longer continue the consumptive way the country is going, the country must go into production. People who understand that you can no longer borrow money for consumption, you borrow money for investment. That is the only way you can come back alive. And that's what we need. But to do that requires a lot. Prof have told me about foreign investor. That is my main topic with you who are here. Why, are we, why am I going around talking to you, pleading with you? One is that you are the main and number one and most important foreign investor the country requires. Nobody, no foreigner can come and invest in Nigeria unless you come and invest. And you are investing to save yourself. Because what are you doing today? Your case is a double whammy. You've run away because you think things are bad. <laughs> That's why you are here. You didn't, you didn't come here because you want to be here. At least 70% of you. That's true. You came because you ran away. But what is even worse for you? You ran away and you are not in a problem. <laughs> because here you are working very hard and you can't live in peace because the people you left behind, you have to take care of them. So you have a crisis. <laughs> because if you are left on your own, it would have been better. But none for every 10 calls you receive is 10 problem, <laughs> if not 11. <laughs> and you can't say no. Because even if you hate them, you will not sleep. Remembering that they are there. They are hungry. You become everything. You are the funeral director. <laughs> Anybody dies, you have to come and bury the person. You are a doctor. You are a nurse. Because everybody that is sick is looking for you. So they turn you into everything. And I said you don't even have peace. So your problem is more. So you have a duty. If you fix that and it's working, then you reduce your own pressure. So you owe a duty to fix that. <laughs> if you fix that and make that place productive, what do you do? You become richer. Yep, that's true. 
Today, Paz has told you, I know that for sure. I lived in the UK for 10 years. My neighbor, I live in num- my four house. I live in number 66. My neighbor was in 64. Because things worked, started working well in his country, in India, he went there and built a factory. The factory employed people from his area. They were producing, they were being paid salary, and he was exporting the goods to the UK and making more money. All these tech companies you see in India, those who started them started from here. So in their own case, they were investing, they're making money, they became richer. In your own case, you're throwing money because you're not a welfare officer who is throwing his money there and you're not getting anything. So you're becoming poorer and the other people are not doing anything because they're not producing anything. So you're going to live your life and die doing welfare. No. If you have the place to work and it becomes productive, you are the first people who are going to come without your resources. That's what my neighbor did. He borrowed money from UK, mortgaged his house, took the money and built a factory. But you know today, everything you take back there is gone. No, no return. <laughs> Nothing. Have you ever taken anything back and you saw any return? No. More complaints will come. In fact, before that one reach, they send the new batch of wine you need to attend to. You can't even go back because of insecurity. Now people bury by Zoom. I mean, I've gone to bury recently. The children are talking to us in Zoom. It's only people like me that were there. So you see the crisis. You face. So you must fix there. Because the problem of there is just leadership. Simple. Nothing else. Not anybody tell you, oh, there's a problem with that. Ni- there's no problem with Nigeria. Problem with Nigeria is that you hired incompetent people who don't have any capacity to do anything. So all they do is tell you schools, tell you story. That's not in securing a place. It's either you have a state or you don't have a state. You can't have non-state actors be more powerful than state. It's not possible. You can't have a state where they now tell you that people are stealing Nigerian oil. Oil is not something you put in your pocket. <laughs> it's not a grocery thing. For you to steal oil, it has to be through ship. The ship has to come into your waters. Navy have to approve for ship to come into your waters. Because you have a navy. So it is being stolen by the same people. That's what Pat was trying to tell you. Those structures they tell you people we don't have is structure of criminality. It is that structure, it is that structure that I want to remove. Because that structure is structure that made it. So it's, it's simple. There's no reason anybody. So anybody will tell you insecurity is this. Yes. Everybody knows that the more you pull people out of poverty, the more you reduce criminality. The more you equip your police and everything, I said, everybody knows that. It is important. The structure that makes it impossible that you can't invest in human capital development. Everybody knows that the more you invest in education of your people, the more money you make. Nigeria have enough population. Somebody got up here and said, oh, we now, remi- we now get from diaspora remittances 
about 20 billion or 30 billion or 20 something billion. No, I want it to be 50 billion. We would do like other countries where we educate our people and have a ministry that ensure how they even leave the country in an organized manner. And they remit money. Because we have the population. We have everything. We have a country with vast land. Vast or cultivated land. And people are begging for food. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. Only in Nigeria. We have millions of people that are not contributing anything except disturbing you. People are stealing our common wealth with our conscience. And like I saw some of you, some of you are equally supporting them. No, it's true. I was governor. I was governor. I used to visit here in America. And when I come, they say, ah, this man has bought a house here. This governor, has, the other one has bought a house here. This one has bought a house here. You can buy your own here. You can do this. And I ask them, why would people be own a house in America? Do I live in America? What type of madness is that? <laughs> and all of you know that at the time you're advising this man, he never owned a house like I'm here now. I don't own anything in America. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you know that when this man was going around preaching and telling you, people, he did not own a house. And suddenly when he now becomes president, he comes and buys it. And you people, some of you will even say he's doing housewarming. Some of you will even come and pray for him. When you know the exact thing to do, that they have to call police and tell him this man has stolen our money. Because you know where the money came from. It was your money. The man didn't own it at the time he was telling you. Now he start telling you, I used to have money. So why didn't you buy it before? Why now? These are things we must. Let nobody tell you fighting corruption is not a problem. We cannot collectively. So when I say the leaders are incompetent, I also question the insane complacency of the followers. Because they just stay and allow people to celebrate. Everywhere I've been in the past four days, I've asked people and tell them my experience of traveling to America, or going to this and everything. That I asked the people in the plane when I was traveling, I said, I had two Nigerians with me. And I asked them one question. Why are we in this plane? Why did we follow this pilot? Did you people know where he came from? <laughs> Everybody answered me, no. So why did we enter the plane? Thank you. Because we believe he's qualified to fly the plane. That was the reason why none of us knew the pilot. And I gave him another example, which I gave yesterday in Houston. Now, I once wanted to go and study in East Africa how education works. And because I was, every other airline was exorbitant, I decided to find one that is cheaper. And I saw Air Rwanda. And then I bought the ticket of Air Rwanda. I never had flown them before. And then when I got home, then my wife said to me, Peter, have you flown Air Rwanda before? I said, no. He said, Peter, I can't understand you. You just go and buy a ticket of the people, airline you don't know about, you don't know where they're coming from. I say, I'm sure the people there are pilot. They can't put plane on the air if they're not pilot. <laughs> because they don't want to die. So I'll follow them. Whatever happens, they will all, will all die, including the pilot. <laughs> but what happened? 
I said to them, I went, when I arrived at the airport, everyone had a brand new Airbus aircraft. And I was saying to myself, fantastic. And I got in there, we only about three of us in the business class, and then when the plane took off, somebody came out of there and said, I'm the captain. My governor, good afternoon. And I said, so who are you? He said, there's two of us here, the pilot and the co-pilot, we're Nigerians. Well, because they have no one to, the one, Nigeria doesn't have the one they can fly. They started flying the other one. If they were Nigerians, they would have said whether they came from north or east or west or central before they put them in the cockpit. That's why the other one failed. They didn't. And I can't go on and on. My dear people, you have a duty. You can reduce your cost. And the way to reduce your cost is to be involved in this change that we're doing. Everybody. That's what I'm doing. That's what Professor Tommy is doing. I tell him every day, you're right going around, a professor of political economy, this will be your last teaching if this one fail. Because nobody will ever listen to you again. <laughs> so that's why we're getting people more and more people and say, let's come together and fix this place. Let's come together and fix it. It is difficult, it's doable. All we are saying is that we don't, it's not going to change overnight. But we want people that can come and say, we are moving from point A to B. When they get to B, they stop. Somebody comes and moves from B to C. We're not asking too much. And this is doable everywhere. In 20 years, Nigeria can generate more than 4,000 megawatts of electricity. Tell me what is the uh, generating power. We used to have pipe bone water even in the streets. We used to have electricity. They used to take like two hours and people were shouting. Two hours, three hours. Now it's become days. You are the one saying, and you are still sending money. <laughs> that is why you participate less of that money, let's change them. Otherwise, it will be forever. Now it's become weeks for nothing. What is that? Nigeria is a country of 200 million people. The biggest country in Africa, the most important country in Africa, with people like you, everywhere you go on the surface of the earth, you see Nigeria playing the role of being an expert, being role of being one of the best. The only place that is not working is in Nigeria. So the biggest country with 200 million people generating 4,000 megawatts of electricity, generating and distributing, and every day all you hear, uh, power grid fail, this one fail. In every other country, you just go in and put your switch. You don't even know who, which is power company. You don't know. Nigeria is one story of the other. The second biggest country in Africa is South Africa in terms of economy. 60 million people, they are generating and transmitting and distributing about 50,000 megawatts. And we are doing four. In the past three weeks, 
South African government had declared emergency in power. You can go and Google it. They declared emergency because they said the power is not enough. It's affecting production. It's affecting this. So they have not said anybody can generate power up to 100 megawatts without license. So somebody who is generating about 50,000 have declared emergency. And somebody who is generating four have not even declared anything. <laughs> when he should have done, what he would have done now is not to declare emergency, but to, I don't know what he would have declared. Maybe only God knows what he would have declared. But he has not declared anything. It's too normal. Countries have declared war on criminality. Nigeria has not done that. Because it was not necessary. You don't have a situation where kidnappers, kidnap people in this time and age, take them to the bush, stay there with one month, feeding them, phoning their family to come and bring money Often a time, if the person is sick, they even allow some doctor to come and treat the person and go back. But the police don't know where they are. <laughs> uh, the only person who don't know where they are is police. But doctors know where they are. To go and treat the person if he's sick. So they wait. At this time and age, that if you call phone anywhere, Everybody know where you are. They are using phone. They are negotiating with the families. And the families are telling people, police, that they called this morning, but they don't know where they are. These are the confusions we want to stop. This is what we want to stop. We want to stop people from stealing public money. They will tell you, no, you can't stop corruption. And nonsense. We know those who took the money. It's very easy. See, the easiest thing you can fight is corruption. We have all sorts of things. We want to cut down the cost of governance. It is totally unacceptable. You make people be governor, it becomes the richest person in the state. In any country where politicians or those in government are richer than business people, the place is failed. <laughs> you celebrated doctor. When we were talking. Doctor cannot be earning maybe 10% of what the governor of North Carolina is earning. How can? And he's still practicing. Professors in university are on strike. Nobody is negotiating with them. We are negotiating with bandits. Corruption kills three things the society leaves. It kills entrepreneurship. It kills professionalism and hard work. You're negotiating with bandits, but you can't sit down with university professors. And you want them to continue to do research and be able to find solutions to what is happening in society. Why don't I become a bandit and negotiate with government? <laughs> That is the crisis you face. So my dear people, with you, we can solve this. We're in a church today. With everything the pastor has told us, God will not solve it. He's God of the whole world. So those, even said it in Bible, those who don't, have, who don't want even the little they have will be taken away from them and given to those who are serious. 
Because he's not going to be looking for where there's no light, where there's no this, where there's no... It's enough problem. He has enough problem already to deal with the entire world. So he better go and bless those who want blessing and leave those who don't want to bless him. After all, he has made it that some will go to heaven, some will go to hell. So if you choose to go to hell, let them go to hell. It's their business. So if you think God is going to solve it for us, no. We are going to solve it ourselves. And that's solving it is why I'm going around. That's why I said no celebration. No title. No award. I'm going to places like when I went to California, they said award. I said, no, no, no award. Every award now will wait till after government. We know whatever the person is qualified to be awarded anything or not. Not when you are in office. Because we have heard this type of story before. Where people come and tell us glossy stories and then do the opposite. But remember what I said and what I'm going to tell you people now is that they must come direct and tell you. Because what they do is to send proses. And when you ask them, you said so. You say, no, no, it was this person who said, no. We are about 18 of us now contending to be president. Don't think it's only Peter Obio. You must listen to all of us. Let nobody send anybody to come and meet you. Let them come personally. <laughs> Say who they are. So that as they are talking, you go and look at their past. Check their name, their age, their school they went, everything. So nobody should come here and tell you I'm sending this person. No. You must go and look at the place where they passed before and be able to say he can do this work or he cannot do it. Because we now have a situation where if you say, oh, it's there, people shout every day and say, what are you going to do? Because I'll listen to the questions you ask. What are you going to do about rate of exchange? What are you going to do about Naira? Naira used to be one Naira. Some of you left Nigeria when Naira was, when it was 67 Kobo. When dollar was 67 Kobo. Some of you left when it was one Naira to one dollar. Some left when it was two. Some left when it was 10. When it was 20. Today is about 700. And people said, how are you going to solve it? It is very easy. The only way to do that is to take the country from consumption to production. <laughs> if you produce goods and export, if you produce goods today and export, you stabilize the Naira and the rate will continue to adjust. It's a, it's a simple thing. If you produce goods and export, I hear you raising your hand, we'll talk about it, you continue to manage your own, it's a simple thing. And I can give you examples of countries that have done that. Because mine is a very simple thing, is to say, ABCD country has done it, I'm a trader. And I know that the more goods you sell and have a better balance of trade and you earn more dollar. The problem Nigeria has today why the dollar is failing is that we don't longer earn dollars. We no longer have dollar resources. If we have dollar resources today, you continue to stabilize and the rates. That's it. Every other thing can be, but this is the basic thing you need to do. That is what you even need to do to make your economy work. Nigeria is 200 million people where there's no production. There's no production. If you look at that, go and check our export in 2021. 
a country of 200 million people living on 923,000 square kilometers of land. Our total export is 18 trillion 900 billion naira, including the famous oil. That's what we end. If you divide it by official rate, which people in government use, is 47 billion naira. If you divide it by my own rate, which is what I believe is official, because they're own, I only hear it. <laughs> it is about 30 billion. They can argue anything. For 200 million people, no. Because we have small countries. We have other countries who are doing the same thing. Vietnam is 100 million, which is half of our population. They live on 331,000 square kilometers of land, which is just a, a quarter of us. Their total export last year was $312 billion. So we didn't even do 10% of what they did by my own rates. And what they exported were manufactured goods. Electronics, 50 something. They did clothing, 30 something billion. And you can go on and on. Footwear. If you go into shops everywhere now, all you are seeing clothing made in Vietnam, made in Bangladesh, everywhere but not Nigeria, what is it making clothes? The Zeni rocket science is making clothing. We should have textile companies all over the place in Kaduna. About people used to, you can sew anything. Why are they not being encouraged? Footwear. All manufacturing company used to be there. They've all died. This is not anything. We can do the same thing. I go to one state after the other. They are waiting to share money from oil. A diminishing assets. Everybody is every day saying that they don't want these assets. Something that is already dead. Okay, look at it. A diminishing assets, everybody knows that in the next few years, nobody will need it. Venezuela has 10 times Nigerian reserve. If oil has not saved Venezuela, it won't save Nigeria. You people are in America. The biggest economy in America is not Texas. They're not number one. They're not number two. They're not number three. I'm not even sure. Maybe there be three or four. It is California. And what is part in California? Agriculture and knowledge. This we have in abundance. We don't know what to do with the vast land that we have in, in the north. I went to Niger State. They're complaining to me they're not getting enough allocation from the federal government resources. And I said to the governor, I don't know what you're talking about. You're sitting on 76.3 thousand square kilometers of land. That is two and a half times the size of Netherlands. Netherlands is minus water is at 3, 000, about 3,000 square kilometers. Last year, the total agricultural export is $120 billion. Imagine if Niger State can feed themselves feed Nigeria, and they export just 1% of that is $1.2 billion. At my rate, 750 billion naira, five times their budget, but they are waiting for money, for more for 30,000 a month. When they have facilities that can give them 50 billion every month, because that's what they are doing to you. So you are sending money to your relations who are not doing anything. No. We want them to be my factory workers. 
So when your money goes there, it becomes an investment. It's a win-win. They are gaining something, you're gaining something. Because they're not doing anything, even if you send money today for them to build your house, they will eat it. <laughs> that must stop. Nigeria must be a productive country. That's what you do here. Do you see any free food anywhere here? Who will give you? If you make mistake, you end up in police now. <laughs> if you see eat free food. So why will you encourage what you encourage? That is what we are begging you. That is what we are going around to tell you to help. Help. Become an advocate. Help us in the advocacy. Put in whatever resources you have in what we are doing for us to change it. That's not, it doesn't, nothing. Be part of it. In a conclusion, before we ask questions, even when we succeed, don't go away. Don't go away. Because that's the part of the problem. Sooner you elect me to be, then you go home and say, okay, Peter who goes there and start answering his excellence. <laughs> While he was preaching, he said, oh, we are going to move from point A to B. When he goes there, he starts telling you people what I saw when I went in. <laughs> Not, we don't want him, everything he needs to see, I've seen it now. <laughs> so I know what we want to. All we say is, Peter, go there. If you say you're going to move this country from 4,000 to 10,000 power. If you get to eight and you're telling us we don't, yes, you might not have 100% result, but 100% effort. Yes. We want to say. Yes. We want to know that you are, you are in that direction we, we agree to go. Don't go and wait. Once you hear Peter saying what you saw, he said, please, please. Don't see anything. Please go, 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 go. So that we can bring somebody who will be seeing what we know, where we know we are going. Because soon as Peter goes in there, start giving you people at schools, then you people start understanding him. Oh, maybe it's difficult. It's my tribe. Oh, they're trying to remove him because he's from, he's an evil man. That's why they're against him. Oh, they're trying to, no, 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 no. Go and tell that Peter says a lie. I've been governor of Anambra State for eight years. Go and tell anybody. No Anambra elite was happy with me. Somebody said it here now because he knows. And I can tell you people, if you succeed, you're not going to be happy with me. But I'm not promising anybody happiness. It's not a happy time. Anybody who wants happy people can go and look for entertainers and comedians. The job is to start fixing Nigeria. And you will see it be happening consistently. No division, no discipline. And we're going to assemble people to make sure. That's why I say don't go away. Because I want to come back and start telling you not coming back to tell you excuse why this did not happen, why this one, no, no, no. I'm contesting to be president of Nigeria. Do not vote for me because I'm an Igbo man. No. Don't vote for me, say, because I'm an Igbo man. I've asked people in the north, is there anywhere not an Asbai bread cheaper? No. Is there any road you people build that only not on our pass? No. Is there where lot of us have uninterrupted electricity? No. I've gone to Southwest, the same thing. I've gone to Southeast, the same thing. It is elite conspiracy. A criminal conspiracy to keep the country down. I'm from North. I'm from East. No. We don't want to hear it again. It is enough. Tell us what you do. Leave your religion. We are not running church. We are running a country. 
We don't, it's not going to be about connection. I don't want to be connected to anybody. If you go, if you look at everywhere I've gone, I refuse them to read out my CV. I have a, very, I have a reasonably good CV. But I refuse them. In Toronto, they insisted, but Peter, people want to know how ah, you were in Oxford, you were in Cambridge, you said no CV. Educational qualification is not a measure of integrity. We are looking for those who will not steal our money again. And it has nothing to do with educational qualification. Because there's thief equally among those people who are happy. There's some like part of Tommy who have it without stealing. There's some who steal. So we want to remove certificates. Everything will come back when things start going well. We'll bring them to the table. That's what we want to do. We now want to see that change come. We want to make it work. Because it has worked in other countries. So it's not something that is impossible. That is why we wanted to work in our place. That is why I said when we succeed, don't go away. Stay there. Be the guard fly to know when the wife started wearing the type of diamond they were not wearing before. And say, something has changed. Where did this woman get the money to find this? Because this is a confusion we create. The wife will now start wearing something he's not been wearing before. And everybody says, it's gorgeous, but it's our money. We want the money to go to school. We want to put it in education of our children. We have now overtaken India in infant mortality. A country of 1.4 billion, a country of 200 million have overtaken them. We want it to go in saving the life of our children, not for the wife to be wearing diamonds. There's no amount of diamonds, sorry, you will wear for that poor country that will make you a rich country. No. So it's time to remove all of our gorgeous dressing and face school, face health, face everything. That's what we want to keep. <laughs> Celebrations have to stop. Because there's nothing to celebrate. It will come back when we have fixed the system. That's what we want to do. I'm extremely appreciative of your time this evening. But remember, you have no other country except this one called Nigeria. Even if you like, live be a citizen of America, Japan, Britain combined. <laughs> they, will, they will say, ask you in a form you feel, your original, <laughs> and you put Nigeria. While you say where you nationalized, you must say where you started this journey. <laughs> so since you are going to say it, election 2023, remember what I said? will not be about tribe, religion, or my turn, or connection, or anything. It is going to be about character, competence, capacity, commitment to start turning around Nigeria. Thank you and God bless you.
Ladies and gentlemen, can I please hear another big hand of applause? I'm going to take a few questions for His Excellency. Um, just uh, get seated. We we'll have a process uh, this evening. If you have a question, we need you to text. Please uh, text your question to 704-609-7776. Again, that is 704-609-7776. And uh, Chief, uh, Chief General Baker will uh, handle the questioning. As soon as uh, he gets your question, he will uh, read it out, and His Excellency will answer it. The tariff on goods, especially cars, trucks, and heavy equipment, have increased by 200 to 600 percent since the present administration in the last two months uh, increased them. And this very without consultation of stakeholders and importers, consideration of the negative impact of Nigerian port players. How are you going to address this as president? Second question from Pascal. My question is, how are you going to encourage manufacturing considering you are promising a production-based economy? Bear in mind, our tariffs now expose her to this concept. In the same token, Nigeria customs are on the road and hinterlands harassing importers who have paid their dues at the ports 
Many people of them and generous citizens of Nigeria have absorbed the cost of these bribes and extortions. Okay, let me just try this uh, number of questions. First is where will you concentrate? What will be your, your priority when you start? Well, you are in America. If I may ask you, because I'm learning also, what is the biggest contributor to American GDP? Huh? No. Gone. Eh? Small businesses. Small businesses, everything. The biggest contributor to Western world economy in terms of GDP is intangible assets. And those intangible assets are number one, security. The only reason we're here, without any of you thinking how to go home, is because you're sure you'll get home. The investor, including local one, has to be alive to enjoy his profit. Number two is law and order. Because I'm sure... I was telling, a man was telling a plane. A man was so heavy that he, he was desperate. He wants to wee, but then there's the plane, the pilot had put seat belt on. And he was telling the lady, no, 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 please. The lady said, no, it is, this thing is actionable for me to allow you to go and use the bathroom. There's a law and order. You are sure that if you go today now and send money to, for somebody to buy you a house in this state, and if that money is missing, you go to court and you recover your money. In Nigeria, you can buy land, buy everything, pay, show evidence of payment, and you go to police, and you become a victim. I have your receipt, proof of payment. Police will be telling you, how did you get the money? <laughs> this is what makes a society. So, what are we going to do first? Is to talk about security of life and property. Because we want the people to be safe. And to do that is not too sophisticated. Today, our police support, we have, in terms of manpower, it is very low. We have about 320,000 police personnel for a country of 200 million. Egypt, 100 million, have over 1 million police. So you have 320, out of which about 70 are the ones that are following people like me. So if you minus them, you have 250. <laughs> so you need to increase it aggressively. You saw the governor of Kasna State saying that they have only 5,000 police. And out of that 5,000, if you go to any station, only one out of three is armed. 
So even if there are 250,000, maybe only about 100,000 have ammunition. So you need to double it for a start. Imagine what it will be when you do that and you can secure the place. One is that in doing that, you're going to create jobs for about a quarter to half a million. Somebody asked me, I said, if you go to my village, there's so many young people because you're doing this through central and state police. There's no reason why we won't have state police. All these excuses they're giving you, it's nonsense. We well, have community police, if that is all we need to require. As governor, I was paying vigilantes in every village and even bought vehicles for them. I bought vehicles for every community. If you do that, it's very easy. By giving that number of people a job, you've already started reducing criminality. the criminality because yeah. they have a job and they will be paid. Right. Today, a minimum wage is 30000 You might say it's nothing, but so many people don't even earn 10 so if you go there and say, I'm going to pay 50, and you're able to employ them, somebody else say, I said, that will cost us about 20 billion now. Somebody say, where are you going to get the, this money, Peter? We're talking about no money, and you say this. I say, well, the accountant general has just told him 180. That is about nine months' salary. <laughs> so I'm going to stop stealing and put the money in this. So that's where you start. Then you bring law and order. We must have law and order. And it starts from the top. You who is the president or governor or anything must obey the law. There's no two laws for any... The law of the governor of Carolina and your own is not different. It's the same thing for everybody. It's not going to be 100 days, though. I'm telling you where we're going to start. <laughs> we're going to invest in education. Nigeria has very low human capital. So we're going to invest in it. And that's where we'll start. And it will be aggressive simultaneously. We're not going to leave this one and do this one. We're going to do it aggressively. On issue of customs and tariff, there's tariff all over the world. Tariff is not our problem. It's to get the custom to understand that it's not a revenue collecting agency, but a business supporting agency <laughs> by changing its mentality. There's no reason why somebody will import goods into Nigeria and it takes several days or months to clear his goods. No. The tariff is not the problem. Custom is not meant to be on the road. They are meant to be at the border. But because custom has become whatever you call it, you are the one who calls. But those things can stop if you don't see other people doing it. So you can. You ask, how am I going to move, considering move Nigeria from consumption to production? I've just given you an example. You remove the revenue. We're going to remove the revenue sharing formula, replace it with production formula. Because we're going to produce for export. You give incentive. When you stop corruption and people don't see people who are, make, who are going around with huge money without a daytime job, you support export led turn around and everything. You, when you start increasing the poor generation, the, for it's been clear that for every 1,000 megawatts of electricity, you add to your economy. You could 
increase your GDP for a developing world between half to one percent. So the more they are doing it, the more you're getting more power. The greatest power of problem of production today is power. So the more you're increasing the availability of power in facilities, in areas like Aba, the more. Your port that you said is a difficult thing, port is supposed to be a trade facilitator. If you go to Port Harcourt, for example, today Port Harcourt is a place you can develop as export port, poor people in Aba, support people in the southeast. We have the country is so sophisticated that you can plan it today that all your agriculture is in the north with Kanu and Karuna as a processing center. Lagos State drives your financial sector while the east drives your manufacturing sector. Easily. You can plan in a country that everywhere will be booming if you put it right. So, how did Vietnam start production? It was just leadership. Vietnam used to be the biggest rice importer. Today, they export rice. It's not, there's nothing in it. It's just a question of saying, this is where we want to go. And we are driving this vehicle in that direction without any excuse. There's nothing. So, and that's where you people come in. Because I said, you have the resources. Three, four of you can stay here and say, okay, we are going to, like the Chinese did, we are going to Nigeria to start a factory that will do this, do this, maybe this clothing we are talking, export it here, we'll sell it here. That's what you are going to do. And we'll be receiving it. Not that you are sending money for people to eat. No. So it is something that is doable. The fourth question, which is the final one, I can't remember very well, but then the fourth question was the issue of, uh, what was the first question? Now, the manufacturing. Echo was. Let me tell you, Africa remains the center of our foreign policy. But you can't talk about foreign policy without having strong domestic policy. That's where you start. All these things you see, they are grouping um, G5, G7, G10, G20, G is economy. If your economy is good, they are putting one G. If it's not good, you are G-less. <laughs> huh? It's mainly economy. What, what makes anybody G7 or G20? They will even invite you for a meeting. It's like that. It's, even as a, it's the same thing with even human beings. If you are doing well, you are invited. If you are not doing well, nobody invites you to any place. It's simple. No invitation. You know? No invitation. Yes, sir, no invitation. I used to, I used to have a, a very rich uncle. And when you are driving with him, you will see somebody say, No, I don't want to see, but I don't want to see this person. I suddenly see another person say, Hey, stop that man, stop that man. So one day I said, Uncle, you said you don't want to see this. You don't see this. Say, this man is full of trouble. This one is. Uh, so it's the same thing. If you are doing well, you are invited. If you are not doing well, nobody wants to see you because you come with trouble. <laughs> so all this Jesus, Jesus is your economy. So you, you, your foreign policy must be driven by your strong domestic policy. There's nothing that made America first world. Except that Guinea, they have something to offer. There's no reason why you want to come here. This place can be Nigeria. Nobody wants to go there. Have you ever seen people queuing up in Afghanistan embassy? No. <laughs> Even if they give it to you free, you don't want to go. So it's a simple thing. So we will... We will do the right thing 
Africa will come. There's a time we used to be peacekeeper for everywhere in Africa. That was when we were doing well. There's a time when we talk, other people will shake. Now, if you talk around, they tell you because they know you are weak. They say, what, How are you talking like that? Who are you telling that? Because they know you're weak. The next set of questions. So, thank you.